Thank you very much for um, coming along. This presentation is about symphony music, um, a relatively new um, digital discovery service for classical music. I'm the general manager. Mark Lewis, our marketing manager, is here at the front. And today I'm going to take you through our sort of journey of digital discovery. To start, I'm going to play you um, a 45 second trailer. So if I don't make any sense after this, at least you have that to give you a quick intro to what Symphony is about. <laughs> should have the gist of it, but um, I'm going to carry on for another 15 minutes or so. Um, so Symphony as a website was launched um, close to 18 months ago, so we've had a, a full year of experience, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of the background and also what we're doing now and, and looking forwards. So why does Symphony exist at all? I think these are probably all topics and points you've discussed, but um, in particular, I think the classical market um, has not converted in the same way as pop um, in the digital space. So um, over the last, I guess, 10 years, been quite a decline in the classical market. Um, the sh shift to digital is very much slower than in other areas of music. Generally, the lack of guidance online, particularly for non-experts, um, and you know, mooted point, but um, lack of engagement for younger audiences. And I think there is a general belief that there's a much wider audience for classical music and poorly served international space. Um, so that's really the idea of having a classical online destination was born through um, all of these. So what is Symphony trying to achieve? Our um, strap line is cutting through classical. Um, so trying to get to the heart of it and, and, and away from the jargon. So Symphony's mission is to reach a new audience but also engage existing audiences. We provide content and tools for discovering and enjoying classical music across a range of platforms. And our aim is to provide a straightforward, curated and credible experience, taking a fresh and innovative approach. So this is our mission, and hopefully I can show you how we, how we are achieving that, at least to some extent. Um, just to tell you a bit about the team, about who makes up Symphony, um, we are editorially independent, so we cover music from all record labels, artists and venues, but we are funded by Universal Music, so initially that was always quite a, a difficult point for people to get across, but I think we've managed to prove in the last year that... Um, we can be independent, even though being funded by um, a, a major company. And that allows us to, to develop our personality and our voice. Uh, the team is made up of editors and journalists, marketing and digital experts, and the people contributing to the site um, across a range of well-known, respected industry names, as well as we're looking for new voices and looking for people from outside of classical that can bring, bring people in as well. So a little bit about our audience, because I always get this question. So who are you targeting? What's your audience? Um, so we've split up the, 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 the population pie into 
hardcore classical fans, developing experts, people with some experience, those who are new or people that, that, that lapsed and people that are not interested at all. So you can see the split, but there is 44% of the adult population um, who can be talked to about classical. And at Symphony, we're aiming at the blue, the blue area. So it's not that we don't want to speak to the hardcore, but um, our focus for our tone and the way that we address things is in the sort of middle, middle section. So from developing experts to new to classical. And then also within that, we try and match our brand and our ethos to particular types of people. Um, so I think people from the UK here may have seen um, this kind of segmentation before. Um, but just to sum up, we focus on three groups who are kind of culturally interested music fans. So what are we doing? Um, one of the key areas of the content that we produce are obviously around showcasing artists. So that's both new and established talent and through film sessions, interviews, articles and guides. So the video element and the audio element of what we do is um, very strong and that's what we try to focus on as well. And there's just some examples of the artists that we've covered in the last year, and you can see it goes from Daniel Barenboim down to Joby Burgess, who I gather is performing, I think, on Saturday night. So it's showing a good range of um, instruments and notoriety. Um, contents and formats. So obviously we have the wealth of the internet at our, um, you know, at, at our disposal, and that means that we are able to present subjects in all kinds of different formats, and that's one of the things that we really focus on: is how to present subjects, artists, storylines in interesting, fun, and informative ways. Um, just some examples here that may be more appealing to the new and younger audience, things like animations telling the stories of composer lives in a couple of minutes through a really beautiful piece of video. The opera strips, again, through comic format, getting the story of an opera across in a couple of minutes, and just using infographics really as viral elements, but to have some informative element behind that as well. So people start to engage and, and interact with content, and that might be at a shallow level to start, but then you always give them um, a next step and an action to go on after that, which is actually very important about our content. We always try to make sure that there is some kind of call to action. So whether it's going to somebody's concert, buying their latest CD, discovering more music, um, we make sure that we always have those next steps so that people are going on a journey. Um, learning and discovery is obviously the backbone of um, our content and we have got hundreds and hundreds of uh, curated journeys of composers and artists and we also do spotlights on key areas which tend to address maybe the beginner market and help them explore topics. Um, in a relatively comprehensive yet engaging way. Our latest one's ballet and music, so I encourage you to go and explore that. And you can see the range of things that, that Symphony does through our spotlights. Purchase offer. So obviously we want people to consume more classical music, whether that's through um, buying physical product, downloads, streaming, or um, going to concerts. And one of the things that we offer is a curated um, set of products and offerings. So we're not trying to be comprehensive. We're trying to help people make, make easier choices. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to address through Symphony is to help people that either don't have enough time or come looking for something and then they get presented with a long list of 50 choices and then run away because they don't know where to start. Um, 
So our music is a curated offering, but it is across all labels um, and offering various retailers and services. So at the moment we offer um, physical through Amazon, download through iTunes and listening through Spotify. But as we go to other markets, we'll also look at key retailers to offer um, there as well. Listening and streaming, obviously this is bringing us into the digital world and it's a very um, central part to what we offer. So there is always usually a playlist and all of the products that we offer will have a listening as well if that's available. Um, so there's hundreds of hand-picked playlists as well as uh, links to stream of all the different albums and podcasts. And I think this is one of the ways that we can really help people experience the music and discover more is by presenting a, a listening opportunity very early on in their journey. More technical, but I think this is important. Um, as everyone moves their consumption through their smaller devices, um, it is important that whatever you're offering online is easily um, accessible, legible, and can be consumed um, through the different platforms. So Symphony has a responsive design, so it looks great on um, mobile, tablet, and desktop. Um, and we're obviously across all channels, so we try to be where, where people are, which is no one place. It can be Spotify, um, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and I think in today's digital world, you can't afford to be in or choose your places to be. You have to spread yourself across all the different channels. And people then choose to consume what you have through their preferred route. Um, tone and personality. So this is, again, very important to us to have a personality. And it is something that's actually quite difficult to develop, but um, you know, we have the ease of, sort of trying to be straightforward, no jargon, um, but also having an opinion. And the way that we're building that up is obviously through our team, through the journalists that we use, through celebrities that can, and personalities that can talk and communicate well about music, um, experts. We also want to use outsiders because they give it that, that different um, approach to somebody who's coming new um, to music and, and bloggers as well. So again, what does all, all this add up to? This is kind of the last, uh, uh, summing up the last few slides. So it's a listening experience. There's lots of video content. We've got over 150 video performances, animations and guides. Um, the learn section is, is probably the richest um, that I've seen for classical music. And we've got over 200 composers, 350 artists, and 500 written articles and interviews. And obviously we have a shop with uh, an intuitive search function. And we're adding to that daily. So this really is a very rich and ever-expanding um, resource for, for people interacting with classical music in the digital space. I guess important for this room probably is um, how we are developing our relationships and working with labels and artists and venues and organizations. And I think very early on, um, we realized that this is of course a, a very important thing of what we do is being supportive of what other people are doing, um, having partnerships and working on things together. So last year, we tended to do more one-off. And as we have grown, we may be extending those partnerships. So one of the biggest um, ventures for us today is with the Edinburgh International Festival, where we are the digital media partner. So that's, that's our most ambitious partnership so far. I was going to get Mark to maybe say a few words about what that is and what it means. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, 
So the Edinburgh International Festival Partnership for us is a big step, as Tina was saying. I think it's one that ranges over content um, production and also marketing support. So we are producing 60 podcasts for the Edinburgh Festival over the next six months, um, each introducing one of the events in the series. This is supported with other editorial content on symphony music, so Pig of the Festival or interviews with artists or video performances. And then as media partner, we are sponsoring a concert within the series, um, making an association with their artists and then spreading the word through our marketing channels. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so these are ways that we are, Edinburgh is getting our kind of service of producing content and, you know, we are also benefiting from their reach. So it's a, a nice mutually beneficial partnership where we can, can work together. Um, and some of the content is, is hosted um, exclusively on their site and some we're sharing across Symphony as well. So looking ahead, um, things that we are focusing on um, going forward, is obviously building on our editorial foundations. Last year was about finding our feet, founding our voice, trying things out. And I guess that process goes on, um, but one of the things we want to do is make it very clear to people who are coming to the symphony service what, what it means to them and how it's relevant to them. So for us, it's, I think, about simplifying our content themes a bit, um, and really making sure we have a strong editorial focus. Um, the listening experience, obviously we have that throughout the site, um, but we want to improve that, maybe look at supporting other streaming services, again, like with our retail experience, um, allowing the consumer to make the choice rather than, than us um, only supporting one. Um, and international, obviously being on the internet, you are already international, so you can't, can't say you're only for one thing. Um, and I think about 60 to 70 percent of our audience is ex-UK. So one of the things we will be doing is looking at addressing um, international audiences um, maybe in a more relevant way um, with local content, making sure that the purchase experience is relevant to them as well, and also getting some of our um, universal family countries involved in um, sourcing content. And as I just mentioned, the continuing developing partnerships and outreach. So again, an important part of what we do. Um, we're looking at finding partners for doing some research on classical music, which also uh, act as a benefit for everybody within the industry. Maybe schools that we can um, develop content for and amateur music making organizations. So this is for you, really. Um, I think it's we can we can do everything we can, but obviously we need the support of everybody who is working in classical music to to develop the future of classical music and our future as well. Um, so I would encourage you to go and look at the site, have a look around, and think how we can be relevant to you, how we can support you, and how we can work with you. And I think. We don't have any boundaries, so you should think as far-reaching as you like and think new and creative and innovative. Um, and then come to us with some ideas. Them. I think I'll stand up, sitting down behind the computer. It's not so good. <laughs> and to test, yes. What's the annual budget and who's paying for it? Is it, uh, is it is the budget coming out of Universal Classics and the revenues of record sales, or how is it done? Well, I'm not really sure I need to answer that question, but... Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you what the budget is, but it's, um, it is funded by Universal and it's out of the central, central budget, so it's not funded by the labels. No. 
Hi, Tina. I'm Chris from Preston Classical. Uh, I'd like to compliment, on the, compliment you on the huge range of different resources you use on the site with the, the, the comic strips for the operas or all the videos and things like that, and they're brilliant. If you've got any um, uh, data you can give us as to which ones are proven most popular with consumers, what people really like, whether they like watching a, a sort of two-minute video or reading or listening... I think it's a whole range of, of things. Um, so the opera strips are very, very popular, and as we do more, they're being picked up by people who are kind of following them as a series. You'll get one-offs, like the, the Which Instrument Should I Learn infographic, and that gets shared, so that was massively popular. So it's really good as a tool for initiating a journey or a conversation. So the fun things are very good for very quick quick wins. Um, the animations as well, I think they, they stop people in their tracks and, and they're very compelling. I don't think people are looking for them, but I think they could form a nice, a really lovely package for someone discovering you know, a composer, maybe the animations, the first thing you look at, and then the next steps you go into listening to the music. Um, but actually, a range, a range of content um, videos are very popular. As we showcase the playlist more, they're becoming more and more popular. Long written articles, not so, as you would probably expect. I mean, the consumption of, of a lot of text online is quite difficult for people to digest. So, it, you know, it's getting the balance between being able to explore a subject properly, but being able to present it in a way that people have time to actually consume it. So we, we still carry on with some of the meaty articles because I think they have benefit and then over time as people become sort of more frequent visitors to the service then they will dip into them as, as they need them. But they, they are harder to kind of sell if you like. Tina, this may be a very obvious question okay. but would you like to give some explanation for the name whether it has anything more complicated other than the fact that it just sounds kind of like symphony. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I actually wasn't involved in the name choosing, except I was presented with two names when I first joined the project. And I can tell you that the other one I couldn't have pronounced. So it was symphony, because I can say it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm not sure if there's any really clever thing behind it. Some people say, oh, I can't spell it. But, you know, it's one of those things. You get used to it and... It rolls off the tongue, so I'm okay with it. I would be curious about the number of uh, monthly visitors and what was your experience with the growth rate? Uh, growth rate? Well, um, initially I think people in the industry were curious, so you could tell the type of... I mean, you don't know who is visiting the site, but just from, from things that possibly they look at, you could tell the type of people. And then we work a lot to seed our content out because obviously we're trying to build a brand from, from nothing and that, that's not an easy thing. So, you know, we, we use people that we're producing content with to also help seed. Um, but the growth has been pretty good. But you do get your, I mean, we don't get big, big troughs, but you get peaks from certain things, particularly when you're starting out. One piece of content might make quite a big difference to your numbers. Um, but then you hope that what it goes down to the next month is at least above where you were. So, yeah, we're quite pleased with where we're going. The number of, the number of your monthly visitors? I'm not going to share that with you, but um, I would say we've reached our targets, so that's good. Um, I would say we're on par with probably bigger record label sites, definitely bigger than most of the UK. Uh, orchestral sites, for example. Are, are you planning to do more video? Well, we already do quite a lot of video, so yeah, I mean, video is in our regular plan. Um, it's obviously expensive, so you can't you can't do overkill on it. But we're very happy to. Um, if people have video content, to also share that on the platform, which we do. So as well as our own bespoke, um, we're happy to, to share other people's video content as well. 
question. Is it, op is it open for other uh, labels as well? I mean, recordings by other major or independent labels? It's open for anybody, as long as it's good. Hi, Tina. I have two short questions. One about tone in the creation of the text that we've just seen, for example. Can you just talk us through, maybe, if you've spoken to the audience to develop that end product and how you reached that stage? And secondly, I work for a symphony orchestra, and I'd be very interested to look at how maybe the BBC National Orchestra of Wales could actually show some of those video clips during our performances and what the cost implications might be. Is it, per, is, is it cost and is it per piece of music or is it for a selection? Thank you. Um, the tone, I don't know if you, if you want to speak about it. I think, um, I think when we first started, we obviously were expressing what we thought um, we wanted and how to address some of, uh, let's call them the issues maybe around classical music and its accessibility, um, but still trying to keep it um, intelligent and relevant so not you know not going from one extreme of the elite to, to dumbing down too much um, and I think it is a difficult thing to develop because you can't just make a personality in a tone you have to find the right people that, that can express that really but also going through the culture segments process of looking at okay properly who is our target audience choosing the people that you're focusing on that also helps you understand what kind of messaging and language I suppose they're, they're going to find appealing um, and in terms of using our content just come and talk to us we haven't charged for anything yet unless it, it, it has a, a, a knock-on commercial um, effect for whoever wants to use it so if it's to help promote things, um, then we won't be charging for it, I don't think. Are we? I think we're up for time, so thank you, everybody.